Subscribe if you like scary stories. When I was in university, I had a scary encounter with a person who was stalking me. This happened around 15 years back, roughly in 2008. Everything began on Facebook when I got a friend request from a dude named Kevin. I clicked accept, which was a bad move, but I was inexperienced at that time. We exchanged some harmless messages for a bit, but his texts soon became intrusive and unsettling. Very odd stuff about him keeping an eye on me. At first I thought he was making a dark joke, and perhaps he was, but I didn't find it amusing. Feeling uneasy, I removed him from my friend list and blocked him, but he didn't stop there. He created new profiles and kept sending me eerie texts. I reported him, but Facebook took its time to react, and I felt trapped in my own virtual space, always on edge, worried about his next move. Soon after, I started seeing an unfamiliar man tailing me on the university grounds. He was always there, lurking in the background, observing me. I was already suspicious about Kevin, so I began to wonder if it was just my imagination. I shared my fears with my friends, and they pushed me to report it to the university's security team. I followed their advice, and the security team assured me they would be on the lookout for any strange activity. However, despite their vigilance, the stalking continued, and I felt increasingly cornered. One evening, while returning to my dorm, I heard steps behind me. I quickened my pace, but the steps got louder. I didn't dare turn around, scared of what I could encounter. When I finally got to my door, I hurried in and secured it. I peeked out the window, and to my dread, I saw that same man standing outside gazing at my window. I was almost certain that he was the man who had been tailing me, and I suspected it was really Kevin. I rang the university security again, and they sent a guard right away, but the man had disappeared. For the next few days, I was extremely on edge. I started using different paths to class, and did my best to avoid being tailed. I also avoided moving around by myself. In desperation, I reached out to the local law enforcement. They told me to be careful and always have someone with me, which I was already doing. They even recommended setting up security cameras in my room, but since there were already cameras in the common areas, I didn't go for it. I lived in a state of perpetual dread, never knowing when he would appear next. The fear of being observed, pursued, and violated haunted me daily. I couldn't concentrate on my academics, and my joyful university life became a living nightmare. Several months later, the police finally made some progress. They managed to track his online behavior to a local house. Armed with a search warrant, they stormed the house and caught the offender. As it turns out, Kevin was a complete stranger, not even a student, just a random guy with a dangerous fixation. For me, that was the end of that dark episode, but it was a horrifying period in my life and the fear I felt will always be etched in my memory. He never served jail time, but he was put on probation or monitoring to ensure he doesn't repeat his actions with me or anyone else. During my first year of college, just three months in, I lived in the school dorms. I had convinced myself that the campus was safe, Sleep was a luxury as we were constantly inundated with assignments and tasks. One late night around 2 a.m., I was working on an assignment with my roommate. I had been so engrossed in the work that I hadn't had any water all day. Given it was summer and I was beginning to feel dehydrated, I decided to get a drink. The closest water source was in a nearby laundry room, a short walk from my dorm room, but located outside the building where I resided. I informed my roommate about my plan so she wouldn't mistakenly lock me out, thinking I'd gone to see my boyfriend. As I exited my room to head towards the laundry room, I nearly collided with a guy I'd never seen before on campus. He didn't apologize, instead greeted me as if we were old friends. His sudden appearance startled me. I felt uncomfortable with his presence and wanted to put some distance between us. I returned his greeting hastily and kept moving, hoping he'd get the hint that I wasn't interested in chatting. However, he seemed oblivious to my disinterest and trailed behind me, trying to engage in conversation by asking my name. It wasn't usual for students, even those pulling all-nighters, to randomly start talking to strangers at that late hour. I quickened my pace, trying to reach the laundry room faster, hoping he would pass me and go his way. But he didn't. Instead, he followed me into the somewhat dark, modestly-sized laundry room. I was jolted when he asked me about my activities. 
Not wanting to upset him, I lied, saying that I was studying. As I filled my bottle from the tap, it felt like time was dragging on. Once my bottle was full, he inquired about my field of study. At this point, I figured I could probably escape, but he strategically positioned himself right in front of me. As I was sealing my water bottle, my heart pounded in my chest. I kept wondering how I landed in this situation and how I could extricate myself from it. The guy was tall, towering at six and a half feet, while I barely measured up to five feet. He kept posing strange questions, which caused me to momentarily freeze, my heart plummeting with fear. In that instant, I realized how vulnerable I was. He could harm me if he wanted to, and I was virtually powerless. But I quickly gathered my wits. Keeping eye contact as if I was about to respond, I spun around swiftly and sprinted back to my room, my sandals smacking against the ground and screams escaping my throat. I didn't dare look back to see if he was in pursuit. All I cared about was reaching a safe place. I stumbled into my unlocked room and fumbled with the lock until I successfully engaged it. My friends and I were known for our playful and loud nature, always pulling pranks. Hence my roommate, assuming this was another joke, gave me a puzzled half-smile, expecting an explanation. However, I was mute, choking back tears. The gravity of the situation hit me, and I broke down, sobbing in front of my roommate, who was now visibly concerned and demanded to know what happened. As I was about to spill the story, we heard footsteps in our corridor, stopping right outside our room. The terror gripped me again, and I burst into more tears, retreating to my bed, whimpering. He knew where I lived. Suddenly we heard the terrifying sounds of someone bellowing, like a wild animal on a rampage. It was him. My roommate peeked through our window blinds just as he disappeared further into the dormitory hallways, still bellowing. After some time, silence ensued. The walls of our dorm rooms were paper thin, and our next-door neighbors shouted, asking us about the disturbance. It was clear they were rattled. Pulling myself together, I briefly narrated the incident to them. I didn't report the occurrence the next day as it was a one-time encounter in our tiny school. I felt confident that I would likely not cross paths with him again. However, I shared this terrifying encounter with many people, so they would remain vigilant in case he decided to return. Let me set the stage. I'm a 22-year-old guy, going to university in the heart of England. I'm currently staying in the dorms, and lately there's been news of folks, especially girls, being attacked. This usually happens when they're coming back alone or in small groups from bars or clubs at night. So, here's what happened. It was a Saturday night and I was recovering from a late night out, feeling a bit hungover. I decided to head over to the local store to grab some painkillers and a few other things. The store is just about an eight-minute walk from my dorm. As I was leaving the store, plugging in my headphones, I saw two girls crying. One of them, I think, looked my way and warned me to be careful up there. At that moment, I didn't think much of it and assumed they might have had a few too many drinks. In fact, I wasn't even sure they were talking to me. I started my walk back along the long road to my dorm and noticed it was unusually quiet. The road was pretty much empty, except for three guys coming my way. They were about average height and build, walking on the same side of the road as me. I crossed the road while checking my phone, as I usually do while walking. I glanced up briefly to see that the guys had also crossed and were watching me. There was no one else around, and I was roughly 15 feet away from them, which made me feel a bit nervous. When they approached, one of them greeted me with a good evening. They seemed to be from Eastern Europe and in their mid-30s. They were dressed casually in jeans, bomber jackets, and sneakers. I replied, saying that I was in a hurry. Another one of the guys stepped in front of me. I wasn't sure if he was trying to intimidate me, but alarm bells started ringing in my head. The guy who spoke to me was holding what looked like leaflets, so I thought they might be advertising something. I lowered my music to better hear what he was saying. He asked me my age and what I was studying. I told him I was 22 and studying forensic science. He then asked if I had a girlfriend. I told him I didn't. Breaking eye contact with the guy I was talking to, I glanced at the third guy's hand. He was fiddling with something in his left hand. It was then that I saw he was holding a pretty big Swiss army knife. At this point, 
I was genuinely scared. The main guy, speaking in a heavy Eastern European accent, asked me where they could find girls. I told them I had no idea and tried to get away from him. But the guy blocking my path didn't move, so I had to push past him. Now, I'm not exactly small, standing at 5'11 inches and weighing about 190 pounds, but I'm not a fighter or someone who seeks out confrontation. So, I was feeling more than a bit nervous at this point. It was clear these men were up to no good. Then the main guy asked me something that really spooked me. He wanted to know if I knew any girls under 18 in the area. I told him I didn't, and he just nodded. Then for some reason, he seemed to become annoyed and was shaking noticeably. The guy then asked me what was in my shopping bag and insisted that I show him. I told him it was just some basic groceries. He pushed my shoulder slightly and asked if I had a younger sister. I told him I was an only child. The main guy scowled at me in a very creepy way. I had no idea what was going to happen next. But then I heard voices and laughter coming from behind me. The men and I both turned to see a group of seven people, men and women. I can't tell you how relieved I felt to see other people on the street. The main guy started to ask me another question, but the guy blocking my path said something in a language I didn't understand. I later googled the words as best as I could, and it turned out to be Bosnian for go. As he said this, he was pushing the arm of the guy holding the Swiss army knife. The group of people was now about 20 feet away from us. That gave me the courage to tell the men that I was in a hurry. I shoved past the guy blocking me and almost ran back to my dorm, which was about 100 meters away. I went directly to my building and straight to my room. Now, the reports of girls being attacked seemed even more real to me. I'm not saying these guys were responsible for the attacks near my dorm, but it certainly made me think about those incidents. I felt so lucky that group of people came down the road when they did. I don't know what would have happened if they hadn't. One of the men had said go. Was he trying to get the others to stab me? Or was he telling the group to leave and abandon their plan? The way these men talked to me and blocked my path surrounding me. It was unsettling. I don't think they had good intentions. I can't say if I'm being overly paranoid or exaggerating, but the questions these men asked were anything but normal. The story starts when I was about seven years old and lasted till I was about 15. I was raised in a little town in the heart of West Virginia, in a mobile home community just a bit outside the town center. My home was shared with my two elder sisters, who were four and five years older than me, my mom, and her partner named Jake. Even though we were newcomers to the town, Jake was a local and knew quite a few folks around. He was actually the local drug supplier. Not long after we moved to the mobile home community, we started getting harassed by an individual we eventually nicknamed The Shadow. One evening, while I was watching TV in the back room, I began feeling uneasy, as if someone was spying on me. I tried to peek through the window, but the room light created a reflection, making it hard for me to see clearly. As I inched closer to the window, a face with glaring eyes gradually came into view. I freaked out completely. Over the course of six years, I saw this man's hand sliding down the window, reaching for things like a gym bag near the window, smacking his hand against the bathroom window, and slowly dragging it down as I stepped out of the shower. The shadow would take spoons from the cutlery drawer, undergarments from my sister's dresser, arrange pebbles neatly on the bed, and leave all the lights on and all the doors open. We began leaving notes saying, Hey, Mr. Shadow, could you please turn off the lights and shut the doors when you exit? P.S. We're running low on spoons. One evening, we returned home to find our bird, Sammy, dead in his cage, hanging by his wings. In the end, we discovered that the shadow was a man called Frank. When we spoke about him, we called him Frank Frank the Sneaky Man. Frank was friends with Jake, and also pals with Frank's brother Larry. Jake and Larry often schemed to catch the shadow by setting up surveillance in the tree line at night, waiting for him to make a move. The only hitch was that Larry would unintentionally tip off Frank about these stakeouts, not realizing that he was the shadow. There was this one night when I was 12, and I was over at a neighbor's place while my mom was working. By this point, Jake had left us, and my sisters were crashing at their friends' places. I chose to head back home to pick up some overnight stuff. When I reached home, the front door was ajar, and all the lights were switched on. 
I entered the house, expecting to bump into my sister. I called out, Hello, is anybody home? Then I started walking down the passage towards the bathroom. As I did so, a man dressed entirely in black, wearing a ski mask, emerged slowly from the back room, hunched over slightly. As soon as he spotted me, he straightened up and walked towards me. He stopped by the back door, about five feet away from me, and gave me a once-over as though he was expecting me to shriek. But instead, I froze, petrified, unable to move or make a sound. Luckily, he darted out the back door right then. That's when I yelled for help. Fast forward two years, I was sitting with a friend on the road next to Frank's mobile home. He was living with his dad at that point. While we were engaged in conversation, Frank approached us. It was about 9.30 in the evening. He inquired whether we'd been sitting there for a while and how much longer we planned to stay. We told him we weren't certain and didn't think much of it. Frank then sauntered away from his mobile home towards another part of the community. Shortly after, we saw a masked man clothed in black approaching Frank's home. The man slid open the back window and began to climb in. Seeing this, we rushed to a neighbor's place and dialed 911. We then returned and sat in the same spot while we awaited the arrival of the police. When the cops did arrive, a few of them approached the window where he had entered, and two other officers knocked on the front door. Frank answered the back window and chatted with the cops. He told one officer that he heard fireworks going off and wanted to investigate. When asked why he would enter through his own bedroom window, he replied, That's just how I felt like getting in. When his dad was interrogated, he told the officers that his son was the only one home and that he had already turned in for the night. For many years following this incident, I was a bundle of nerves. I would stay up at night, listening for unusual sounds. I would leave the kitchen light on and my bedroom door ajar, on the lookout for shadows on the walls. Overcoming the post-traumatic stress disorder took me quite a while. I moved out of state several years later. Sometime after, I got a phone call from an old friend from my childhood who knew about the shadow. She informed me that the shadow had died of a heart attack. I wouldn't wish death on anyone, but I'm relieved he can't terrorize any other family like he did mine. So to Mr. Shadow, I hope there's a unique place reserved for you.